This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Donald Hoffman. book, The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes, you make the bold claim that the world we see with our eyes is not real. It's not even an abstraction of objective reality. It is completely detached from uh, objective reality. Can you explain this idea? Right. So this is a theorem from evolution by natural selection. So the technical question that I and my team asked was... to guide adaptive behavior, full stop. So the evolutionary process, the process that took us from the origin of life on Earth to the humans that we are today, that process does not maximize for truth, it maximizes for fitness, as you say. Fitness beats truth. And fitness does not have to be connected to truth, is the claim. And that's where you have an approach towards zero of probability that we have evolved human cognition, human consciousness, whatever it is, the magic that makes our mind work, evolved not for its ability to see the truth of reality, but its ability to survive in the environment. That's exactly right. So most of us intuitively think that surely the way that evolution will make our senses more fit is to make them tell us more truths, or at least the truths we need to know yeah. about objective reality, the truths we need in our niche. That's the standard view, and it was the view I took. I mean, it's, that's sort of what we're taught or just even assume. It's just sort of like the intelligent assumption that we would all make. But we don't have to just wave our hands. Uh, evolution of a natural selection is a mathematically precise theory. Uh, John Maynard Smith uh, in the 70s uh, created evolutionary game theory. And we have evolutionary graph theory and even genetic algorithms that we can use to study this. And so we don't have to wave our hands. It's it's a matter of theorem and proof and or simulation before you get the theorems and proofs. And uh, a couple of graduate students of mine, Justin Mark and Brian Marion, um, did some wonderful simulations that tipped me off that there was something going on here. And then I went to a mathematician, Chaitan Prakash, and Manish Singh, and uh, some other friends of mine, uh, Chris Fields. And But Chaitan was the real mathematician in, in, behind all this. And he's proved several theorems that uh, uniformly indicate that, um, with one exception, which has to do with probability measures, um, there's no uh, the probability is zero. The, the reason there's an exception for probability measures, so-called sigma algebras or... or um, Sigmatative classes is that for any scientific theory, uh, there is the assumption that, that needs to be made that the whatever structure, the whatever probabilistic structure the world may have, is not unrelated to the probabilistic structure of, of our perceptions. If they were completely unrelated, then no science would be possible. So, in, so this is technically the the map from reality to our senses has to be a so-called measurable map, has to preserve sigma algebras. But that means it could be infinite to one, and it could collapse all sorts of, of event information. But other than that, there's, there's no requirement. In mm-hmm. Here, mm-hmm. Which is, the thing we see with our eyes is not some kind of limited window into reality that is completely detached from reality, likely completely detached from reality. You're saying 100% likely. Okay, so none of this is real in the way we think is real. In the way we have this intuition, there's um, like this table 
is some kind of abstraction, but underneath it all, there's atoms. And there's an entire century of physics that describes the functioning of those atoms and the quarks that make them up. There's uh, many Nobel Prizes about particles and fields and all that kind of stuff that uh, slowly builds up to something that's perceivable to us, both with our eyes, with our different senses, as this table. Then there's also ideas of chemistry that over layers of abstraction from DNA to embryos, the cells that make the human body. So all of that is not real. It's a real experience and it's a real adaptive set of perceptions. So it's an adaptive set of perceptions, full stop. We want to so think the that perceptions because- are- to hide the truth because the truth is too complicated. It's just like if you're trying to, you know, use your laptop to write an email, right? What you're doing is toggling voltages in the computer. But good luck trying to do it that way. That's we, the reason why we have a user interface is because we don't want to know that quote unquote truth the diodes and resistors and all that that terrible hardware if you had to know all that truth it would you know your friends wouldn't hear from you so you so what evolution gave us was perceptions that guide adaptive behavior and part of that process it turns out means hiding the truth and giving you um uh, eye candy so what's the difference between hiding the truth and forming abstractions uh, layers upon layers of abstractions over these over low level voltages and transistors and, uh, and chips and uh, programming languages from assembly to Python that then leads you to be able to have an interface like Chrome where you open up another set of JavaScript and HTML uh, programming languages that lead you to have a graphical user interface on which you can then send your friends an email. Is that completely detached from the zeros and ones that are firing away inside the computer? It's not. Of course, when I talk about the user interface on your desktop, um, there's this whole sophisticated backstory to it, right? That, That the hardware and the software that's allowing that to happen. Evolution doesn't tell us the backstory, right? So the theory of evolution is not going to be adequate to tell you what is that backstory. It's going to say that whatever reality is, and that's the interesting thing. It says whatever reality is, you don't see it. You see a user interface, but it doesn't tell you what that user interface is, how it's built, right? Now we can we can try to look at certain aspects of the interface, but already we're going to look at that and go, real, okay, before I would look at neurons and I was assuming that I was seeing something that was uh, at least partially true. And now I'm realizing it, it could be like looking at the pixels on my desktop uh, or icons on my desktop and good luck, you know, going from that to the data structures and then the voltages and the, I mean, good luck. It, it, there's just... No way. So what's interesting about this is that our scientific theories are... Now, physicists are saying space-time is doomed. There's no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the laws of physics. And that comes actually out of gravity together with quantum field theory. It just comes right out of it. It's, it's, It's... a theorem of, of, of those two theories put together. But it doesn't tell you what's behind it. So the physicists are, know that their, their best theories, Einstein's gravity and quantum field theory put together, entail that space-time cannot be fundamental, and therefore particles in space-time cannot be fundamental. They're just irreducible representations of the symmetries of space-time. That's what they are. So we have, so space-time, so we put the two together. We put together what the physicists are discovering, and we can talk about how they do that. And then we, the new discoveries from evolution with natural selection, both of these discoveries are really in the last 20 years. And what both are saying is um, space-time has had a good ride. 
It's been very useful. Reductionism has been useful, but it's over. And it's time for us to go beyond. When you say space-time is doomed, is it the space, is, the, is, the, is it the time, is it the very hard-coded specification of four dimensions? Uh, or are you specifically referring to the kind of uh, perceptual domain that humans operate in, which is space-time? You think like there's a 3D, um, like the, our world is three-dimensional and time progresses forward, therefore, Three dimensions plus one, four D. What, uh, what, what exactly do you mean by space time? What, what, what do you mean by space time is doomed? Great, great. So this is, by the way, not my quote. This is from, for example, Nima Arkani Hamed at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Ed Witten, also there. David Gross, Nobel Prize winner. So this is not just something the cognitive scientists. This is what the physicists are saying. Yeah, the physicists are space time. Uh, Skeptics. Yeah, they're saying <laughs> that, and I can say exactly why they think it's doomed, but what they're saying is that, because you know, your question was, what, what aspect of space-time, what are we talking about here? It's both space and time, their union into space-time as in Einstein's theory. That's doomed. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're basically saying that uh, even quantum theory, uh, this is with Neymar, Kani, Hamed especially. So th th Hilbert spaces, will not be fundamental either. So that that the notion of Hilbert space, which is really critical to quantum field theory, quantum information theory, uh, that's not going to figure in the fundamental new laws of physics. So what they're looking for is some new mathematical structures beyond space-time, beyond you know, Einstein's four-dimensional space-time or supersymmetric version, you know, geometric algebra signature, two comma four kind of, uh, there are different ways that you can represent it, but they're finding new structures. And then, by the way, they're succeeding now. They're finding, they found something called the amplituhedron. This is Nima and his colleagues, the, the cosmological polytope. These are, so the, there are these like polytopes, these polyhedra in, in multi dimensions, generalizations of simplicities that are coding for, for example, the scattering amplitudes of, of processes in the Large Hadron Collider and other, other colliders. So they're finding that if they let go of space-time completely, they're finding new ways of computing these scattering amplitudes that turn literally billions of terms into one term. When you do it in space and time, because it's the wrong framework, it's 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 just a user interface from that's now from the evolutionary point of view it's just user interface it's not a deep insight into the nature of reality so it's missing deep symmetries something called a dual conformal symmetry which turns out to be true of the scattering data but you can't see it in space time and it's making the comp the computations way too complicated because you're trying to compute all the loops and Feynman diagrams and all the Feynman integrals. So, see, the Feynman approach to the scattering amplitudes is trying to enforce two critical properties of space-time, locality and unitarity. And so by when you enforce those, you get all these loops and multiple, you know, different levels of loops. And for each of those, you have to add new terms to your computation. But when you do it outside of space-time, you don't have the notion of unitarity. You don't have the notion of locality. You have something deeper and is capturing some symmetries that are actually true of the data. And But then when you look at the geometry of the facets of these polytopes, then certain of them will code for unitarity and uh, locality. So it actually comes out of the structure of these deep polytopes. So what we're finding is there's this whole new world. Now, beyond space-time that is making explicit symmetries that are true of the data that cannot be seen in space-time, and that is turning the computations from billions of terms to one or two or a handful of terms. So we're getting insights into symmetries, and, we're, and all of a sudden the math is becoming simple because we're not doing something silly. We're not adding up all these loops in space-time. We're doing something far deeper. But they don't know what this world is about. All, so, you know, they're in an interesting position where we know that space-time is doomed, and I, I should probably tell you why it's doomed, what they're saying about why it's doomed, but, but they need a flashlight to look beyond space-time. What, what flashlight are we going to use to look into the dark 
beyond space-time because Einstein's theory and quantum theory can't tell us what's beyond them. All they can do is tell us that when you put us together, space-time is doomed at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Beyond that, space-time doesn't even make sense. It just has no operational definition. So, but it doesn't tell you what's beyond. And so they're, they're just looking for deep structures, like guessing it's really fun. So these really brilliant guys, generic, brilliant men and women who are doing this work, mm. uh, physicists, are making guesses about these structures, informed guesses, because they're trying to ask, well, okay, what deeper structure could give us the stuff that we're seeing in space-time, but without certain commitments that we have to make in space-time, like locality. So they make these brilliant guesses, and of course, most of the time you're gonna be wrong, but once you get one or two that start to pay off, and then you get some lucky breaks. So they got a lucky break back in 1986. Um, a couple of mathematicians named Park and Taylor took the scattering amplitude for two gluons coming in at high energy and four gluons going out at low energy. So that kind of scattering thing. So, so like apparently for people in, who are into this, that's sort of something that happens so often you need to be able to find it and get rid of those because you already know about that and you need to. So you needed to compute them. It was billions of terms. And they couldn't do it, even though for the supercomputers couldn't do it. <laughs> and it turned out to be equivalent. So billions of terms reduced to one term, that so-called famous Park-Taylor formula, 1986. And that was like, Okay, where did that come from? What This is a pointer into a deep realm beyond space and time, but, but no one, I mean, what can you do with it? And they thought maybe it was a one-off, but then other formulas started coming up, and then eventually Nimar Khani Hamed and his team found this thing called the amplitudehedron, which really sort of captures the whole, a, a big part of the whole ball of wax. Um, I'm sure they would say, no, there's plenty more to do. So, so I won't say they did it all by any means. They're looking at the cosmological polytope as well. So what's remarkable to me is that two pillars of modern science, quantum field theory with gravity on the one hand and evolution by natural selection on the other, just in the last 20 years have very clearly said space-time has had a good run Reductionism has been a fantastic methodology. So we had a great ontology of space-time, a great methodology of reductionism. Now it's time for a new trick. <laughs> but now you need to go deeper and, and show, but by the way, this is doesn't... So that's a strong constraint on, on this work. So it's even the evolution by natural selection and uh, quantum field theory or could be interfaces into something that that doesn't look anything like, like you mentioned. I mean, it's interesting to think that evolution might be a very crappy interface into something much deeper. That's right. They're both telling us that the framework that you've had can only go so far, and it has to stop. And there's something beyond. And that framework, the very framework that is, is space and time itself. Now, of course, evolution by natural selection is not telling us uh, about like Einstein's relativistic space time. So that was another question you asked a little bit earlier. It's telling us more about our perceptual space and time, which um, we have used as the basis for creating first a Newtonian space versus time as a mathem mathematical extension of our perceptions. And then Einstein then took that and, and extended it even further. So the relationship between what evolution is telling us and what the physicists are telling us is that in some sense, the Newton and Einstein space-time are formulated as sort of rigorous extensions of our perceptual space, um, making it mathematically rigorous and, and laying out the symmetries that, that, that they find there. So that's sort of the relationship between them. So it's the perceptual space-time that evolution is telling us is just a, a user interface, effectively. And then the physicists are finding that even the mathematical extension of that into the Einsteinian formulation has to be, as well, um, not the final story. There's something deeper. So let me ask you about reductionism and interfaces as we march forward from Newtonian... <laughs>
can't be deduced from within that framework. And if you add the new statements to your axioms, then there'll be always new statements that are true, but can't be proven with the new axiom system. And the best scientific theories um, in, in physics, for example, and also now evolution are mathematical. So our theories are going to be, they're going to have their own assumptions and um, they'll be mathematically precise. And there'll be theories perhaps of everything except those assumptions because the assumptions are, we say, please grant me these assumptions. If you grant me these assumptions, then I can explain this other stuff. But so you have the assumptions that um, are like miracles as far as the theory is concerned. They're not explained. They're the the starting points for explanation. And then you have the mathematical structure of the theory itself, which will have the girdle limits. And so my, my take is that um, reality, whatever it is, is always going to transcend any conceptual theory that we can come up with. There's always going to be mystery. <laughs> gold to physical reality but then you can use money to exchange uh to exchange value to trans transact uh so when when it was on the gold standard the money would represent some stable uh component of reality isn't it more effective to avoid things like hyperinflation if we generalize that idea isn't it better to connect your, uh, whatever we humans are doing in the social interaction space with each other. Isn't it better uh, from an evolutionary perspective to connect it to some degree to reality so that the, the, the transactions are settled with something that's universal as opposed to us constantly operating in something that's a complete illusion? Isn't it easy to hyperinflate that? <laughs> like where where you really deviate very, very far away from um, from the underlying reality, or do you not never get in trouble for this? Can you just completely drift far, far away from the underlying reality and never get in trouble? That's a great question. So, you know, on the financial side, there's two levels at least that we could take your question. One, one is strictly like evolutionary psychology of financial systems. Um, and that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, and there the decentralized idea, the De DeFi kind of idea in, in cryptocurrencies may make good sense from just an evolutionary psychology point of view. Having, you know, human nature being what it is, putting a lot of faith in a few central controllers um, depends a lot on the veracity of those and trustworthiness of those few central controllers. And we have ample evidence time and again that um, that's often betrayed. So it, it makes good evolutionary sense, I would say, to have a decentralized, I mean, democracy is a step in that direction, right? We're, we, don't, we don't have a monarch now telling us what to do. We decentralize things, right? Because if the monarch, if you have Marcus Aurelius as your emperor, you're great. If you have Nero, it's not so great. And so we don't want that. So democracy is a step in that direction. But but I think the DeFi thing is is an even bigger step and is is going to even make the democratization even even greater. So so that's one level of also the fact that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely is also an evolu a consequence of uh, evolution. <laughs> right. That's also a feature, I think. Right? right, you can argue from the long span of living organisms, it's nice for power to corrupt for you to. It, so, uh, mad men and women throughout history might be useful to teach us a lesson. <laughs> we can learn <laughs> from our ourselves. negative example, right? Exactly. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. So, power does corrupt, and I think that you can think about that again from an evolutionary point of view. But I think that your question was a little deeper when that was, is, does the evolutionary interface idea sort of unhinge science from, from some kind of important test for the theories, right? We don't want, yeah. it, it doesn't mean that anything goes in scientific theory, but there's no, 
if there if we don't see the truth, is there no way to tether our theories and, and test them? And and I think there there is no problem there. We <laughs> the values exist even when no one is looking at them, and that they're an objective truth. And and our best theories are telling us no. The pointers pointers are just pointers. And that's what you have to rely on for making your judgments. Um, but um, the, even the pointers themselves are not the objective reality. So, and, and I think Gödel is telling us that not that um, anything goes, but you know, as you develop new axiom systems, you will find out what goes within that axiom system and what what testable predictions you can make. So, I don't think. We're, we're untethered. We, we continue to do experiments. What I think we're, we won't have that we want is a conceptual understanding that gives us a theory of everything that's final and complete. I, I think that this is, to put it another way, this is job security for scientists. <laughs> our, our job will never be done. It's job security for neuroscience because before we thought that when we looked in the brain, we saw neurons and neural networks and and uh, you know action potentials and, and synapses and so forth, and that's that, that was it. That that was the reality. Now we have to reverse engineer that. We have to say what is beyond space time. What is going on? What is a dynamical system beyond space time? That when we project it into Einstein's space time, gives us things that look like neurons and neural networks and synapses. That's so we have to reverse engineer it. So there's going to be lots more work for neuroscience. It's going to be far more complicated and, and difficult and challenging. But but that's wonderful. That's what we need to do. We thought neurons exist when they aren't perceived and, and they don't. In the same way that if I show you, when I say they don't exist, I, I should be very, very concrete. If I draw on a piece of paper a little sketch um, of, of something that is called the Necker cube, it's just a little line drawing of a cube, right? It's on a flat piece of paper. If I execute it well and I show it to you, you'll see a 3D cube and you'll see it flip. Sometimes you'll see one face in front, sometimes you'll see the other face in front. But if I ask you, you know, which face is in front when you don't look? You know, the answer is, well, neither face is in front because there's no cube. There's just a flat piece of paper. Yeah. So when you look at the piece of paper, you perceptually create the cube. And when you look at it, then you fix one face to be in front and one face to be in front. So that's what I mean when I say it doesn't exist. Space-time itself is like the cube. It's a day. Dimensional space, or we can talk about space-time maps in some way that we uh, maybe don't yet understand, but will one day understand what that mapping is, but it maps reliably. It is tethered in that way. Well, yes. And, and so the new theories that the physicists are finding beyond space-time have that kind of tethering. So they're, they show precisely how you start with an amplitudehedron and how you project this high-dimensional structure into the four dimensions of space-time. So there's a precise procedure that, that relates the two. And uh, they're doing the same thing with the cosmological polytopes. So, so they're, the, they're the ones that are making the most uh, you know, concrete and, and fun advances going beyond space-time. And they're, they're, they're these static geometric structures, which is impressive. I'm, so I'm not putting them down. This is what they're doing is unbelievably complicated and, and brilliant and uh, uh, adventurous, all the and it's, it's all those things and beautiful and, and beautiful, uh, yeah, uh, right. from a human aesthetic perspective because geometry is beautiful. It's it absolutely and it's they're finding symmetries that are true of the data that can't be seen in space time. But I'm looking for a theory beyond space time that's a dynamical theory. I would love to find, and we can talk about that at some point, a, a theory of consciousness in which. The dynamics of consciousness itself will give rise to the geometry that the physicists are finding beyond space-time. If we can do that, then we'd have a completely different way of looking at how consciousness is related to what we call the brain or the physical world more generally. Right, right now, 
all of my brilliant colleagues, well, about 99% of them are trying to, they're, they're assuming space-time is fundamental. They're assuming that particles are fundamental, quarks, gluons, leptons, and so forth. Elements, atoms, and so forth are fundamental, and that therefore neurons and brains are part of objective reality. And that somehow when you get matter that's complicated enough, it, it will somehow generate conscious experiences by its functional properties. Or if you're panpsychist, um, maybe you, you, in addition to the physical properties of particles, you add a, you know, a consciousness um, pr uh, property as well. And then you have, you co combine these physical and conscious properties to get more complicated ones. But they're all doing it within space time. Mm -hmm. All of the work that's being done on consciousness and its relationship to the brain is all assumed something that our fit, our best theories are telling us is doomed, space-time. Why does that particular assumption bother you the most? So you bring up space-time. Uh, I mean, that's just one useful. Conceptual framework that we've had in science. N not to the scientific method, but to the, the fundamental ontology and also the fundamental methodology, the ontology of space-time and its contents, and the methodology of reductionism, which is that as we go to smaller scales in space-time, we will find more and more fundamental laws. And that's been very useful for, for the space and time for centuries, reductionism for centuries, but, but now we realize that um, that's over. Reductionism is in fact dead as is space-time. What exactly is reductionism? What is the process of reductionism that is different than uh, the, some of the physicists that you mentioned that are trying to think, trying to let go of the assumption of space-time, looking beyond? Isn't that still trying to come up with a simple model that explains this whole thing? Isn't it still reducing? It's a wonderful question because it really helps to clarify two different notions, which is scientific explanation on the one hand, and a particular <laughs> principles. Same thing with his theory of gravity, right? It's, it's the falling elevator idea, right? So this is not a reductionist kind of thing. It's, it's <laughs> I don't even know how to comprehend either of those numbers, frankly. <laughs> uh, do, just a small aside, because I am a computer science person, I also find cellular automata beautiful. Yes. And uh, so you have somebody like uh, Stephen Wolfram, who recently has been very excitedly exploring a, a proposal for a data structure that could be uh, um, the numbers that would make you a little bit happier in terms of scale, because they're very, 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 very tiny. Um, so do you like this space of exploration, of really thinking, letting go of space-time, letting go of everything, and trying to think what kind of data structures could be underneath this whole mess? That's right. So if they're thinking about these as outside of space-time, then that's, the, that's what we have to do. That's what our best theories are telling us. You now have to think outside of space-time. Now, of course, I should back up and say, we know that Einstein surpassed Newton, right? But that doesn't mean that there's not good work to do on Newton. There's all sorts of Newtonian physics that takes us to the moon and so forth, and there's lots of good problems that we want to do, solve with Newtonian physics. The same thing will be true of space-time. We'll, we'll still, it's not like we're gonna stop using space-time. We'll continue to do all sorts of good work there. But for, for those scientists who are really looking to go deeper, to actually find the next, you know, just like what Einstein did to Newton, what, what are we gonna do to Einstein? How do we get beyond Einstein and quantum theory to something deeper? Then we have to actually let go. And, and if we're gonna do like this, uh, 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 automata kind of approach. It's, it's critical that it's not automata in space-time, it's automata prior to space-time from which we're going to show how space-time emerges. If you're doing automata within space-time, well, that, that might be a fun model, but it's not the radical new step that we need. Yeah, so the space-time emerges from that whatever system. And yeah, like you're saying, it's, it's a dynamical system. Do we even have an understanding what dynamical means? when we go beyond 
it's the, when when you start to think about dynamics, it could mean a lot of things. Even causality could mean a lot of things. If, if lesion in a you know, computer, it's very very clear that lesion experiments on computers are not going to give you a lot of insight yeah. into how it works. And also the measurement devices and the kind of sort of just using the basic approaches of neuroscience, collecting the data. Uh, trying to intuit about the underlying function of it. And that helps you understand that our scientific exploration of concepts, um, depending on the field, uh, are, are maybe in the very, very early stages. I wouldn't say it leads us astray. Perhaps it does sometimes, but it's not a... Uh, it's not anywhere close to some fundamental mechanism that actually makes a thing work. I don't know if you can sort of comment on that sure. in terms of using neuroscience. To... Exactly. In fact, what got me into the field that I at MIT was um, work by David Marr on this very topic. So David Marr was a professor at MIT, but he'd done his PhD in neuroscience, studying just the architectures of the brain. But he realized that his, his, his work, it was on the cerebellum. Um, he, he realized that his work, as, as, as rigorous as it was, left him unsatisfied because he didn't know what the cerebellum was for <laughs> yeah, and, and, and why it had that architecture. And so he, he went to MIT and he was in the AI lab there. And, and, uh, he, he said he had this three-level approach that really grabbed my attention. So I, when I was an undergrad at UCLA, I read one of his papers in a, in a class and said, who is this guy? Because he said, you have to have a computational theory. What is being computed and why? Hmm. An algorithm. How is it being computed? What, what are the precise, precise algorithms? And then the hardware. How does it get instantiated in the hardware? And so to really do neuroscience, he argued, we needed to have um, understanding at all those levels. And I... That really got me. I loved the neuroscience, but I realized this guy was saying, if you can't build it, you don't understand it effectively. And so that's why I went to MIT. And I, I had the pl pleasure of working with David until he, he died as, you know, just a year and a half later. So there was, there's been that idea that, you know, with neuroscience, we, we have to have, in some sense, a top-down model of what, what, what's being computed and why that we would then go after. And the same thing with the, you know, trying to reverse engineer, uh, you know, a computing system like your laptop. We really would, we really need to understand what the user interface is about and why we have, what are keys on the... A bold question that shakes you out of your dream state. Does this fiction still help you in building intuitions? as literary fiction does about reality. The reason we read literary fiction uh, is it helps us build intuitions and in understanding in indirect ways, sneak up to the difficult questions of human nature. Great fiction. Same with this. Something that spiritual traditions have said for thousands of years but haven't said precisely, so we can't take it seriously in science until it's made precise, but we might be able to make it precise. In, and that is that um, they've, they've also said something like um, space and time aren't fundamental, they're Maya, they're, they're illusion. And, but, but that um, if you look inside, if you introspect uh, and let go of all of your particular perceptions, uh, you will come to something that's beyond con conceptual thought. And that is, they claim, uh, being in contact with the deep ground of being that, that transcends any particular conceptual understanding. If that is correct, now I'm not saying it's correct, uh, but I, and I'm not saying it's not correct. I'm just saying, if that's correct, then it would be the case that as scientists, because we also are in touch with this ground of being, we would then not be able to conceptually understand ourselves all the way, but we could know ourselves just by being ourselves. And so we would, th there would be a sense in which there is a fundamental grounding to the whole 
enterprise because we're not separate from the enterprise. This is the opposite of third the the impersonal third person science. This this would make science go personal <laughs> personal all the way down, and and but but nevertheless scientific because the scientific method would still be what we would use all the way down for the conceptual understanding. Unfortunately, you still don't know if you went all the way down. It's possible that this kind of whatever consciousness is, and we'll talk about it, is getting um, the, <laughs> the cliche statement of be yourself. Uh, is is it, it is somehow digging at a deeper truth of reality, but you still don't know when you get to the bottom. You know, a lot of people, they'll take psychedelic drugs, and they'll say, well, that takes my mind to certain places where it feels like that is revealing some deeper truth of reality. But it's still, it could be interfaces on top of interfaces. That's, that's um, in your view of this, you really don't know. I mean, it's Gato's incompleteness, is that you really don't know. My own view on it, for what it's worth, because I don't know the right answer, but my own view on it right now is that it um, it's never ending. I think that there will never that this is great, as I said before, great um, job security for science, and that we, if this is true, and if if consciousness is somehow important or fundamental in the universe, this may be an important fundamental fact about consciousness itself. That that it's a never ending exploration that's going on. In some sense, well, well, that's interesting. Let me push back on the job security. Okay. So maybe as we understand this kind of idea deeper and deeper, we understand that the pursuit is not a fruitful one. That maybe we need to. Maybe that's why we don't see aliens everywhere. Is you get smarter and smarter and smarter. You realize that like exploration is uh there's other fun ways to spend your time than exploring you could be um you could be sort of living maximally in some way that's not exploration um you know i could there's all kinds of video games you can construct and where it's not job security where scientists become more and more useless. Uh, maybe they're like the holders of the ancient wisdom uh, that's that allows us to study our own history, but not much more than that. Just to get well, well, that's, fun that, pushback. That's, that's good pushback. I, I'll, I'll put one in there for the scientists again. Um, yes. <laughs> but, but, but sure, but then I'll take the other side too. So when... Uh, Faraday did all of his experiments right, with magnets and electricity and so forth. He came up with all this wonderful empirical data and James Clerk Maxwell looked at it and wrote down a few equations, which we can now write down in a single equation, the, the Maxwell equation if we use geometric algebra, just one equation. That opened up unbelievable technologies. Where, you know, People are zooming and talking to each other around the world. Um, the whole electronics industry, there was something that transformed our lives in a very positive way. With the theories beyond space-time, here's one potential. Right now, most of the galaxies that we see, um, we can see them, but we know that we could never get to them, no matter how fast we traveled. They're going away from us at the speed of light or beyond. So we can't we can't ever get to them. So there's all this beautiful real estate that's just smiling and waving at us and we can never get to it. Yeah. But that's if we go through space-time. But if we recognize that space-time is just a data structure, it's not fundamental. We're not little things inside space-time. Space-time is a little data structure in our perceptions. Mm -hmm. It's just the other way around. Once we understand that, and, and we get equations for the stuff that's beyond space-time. Maybe we won't have to go through space-time. Maybe we can go around it. Maybe I can go to Proxima Centauri and not go through space. I can just go right there directly. It's a data structure. We can start to play with it. So, so I think that my, for what it's worth, my take would be that 
that the endless sequence of theories that we could contemplate building will lead to an endless sequence of new remarkable insights into the potentialities the possibilities mm -hmm. that would that would that would seem miraculous to us and that we will be motivated to continue the exploration partly um, just for the technological innovations that that come out but you're the other thing that you mentioned though what about just being what if we what if we decide to, instead of all this doing and exploring what about being my guess is that the best scientists will do both and that the act of being will be a place where they get many of their ideas and that they then pull into the conceptual realm. And I think many of the best scientists, you think, well, I mean, Einstein comes to mind, right? Where these guys say, look, I didn't come up with these ideas by a conceptual analysis. I was thinking in vague images and I was, it was just something... <laughs> Because you mentioned evolutionary game theory, and that's really where you, the perspective from which you come uh, uh, to form the case against reality. Uh, at which point in our evolutionary history do we start to deviate the most from reality? Is it, uh, is it way before life even originated on Earth? Is it um in the early development from bacteria and so on or is it when some inklings of what we think of as intelligence or maybe even uh complex consciousness uh started to emerge so where did this deviation um just like with the interfaces on in a computer you know you start with transistors and then you have uh assembly and then you have uh, C, C++, and then you have Python, and then you have GUIs, and all that kind of, you have layers upon layers. When do we start to deviate? Well, David Marr, again, my advisor at MIT, in his book, Vision, suggested that the more primitive sensory systems were less realistic, less veridical, but that by the time you got to something as complicated as the humans, we were actually tr estimating the true shapes and distances to objects and so forth. So so his point of view, and I think it was probably, it's not an un, uncommon view among my colleagues that, that, yeah, the sensory systems of lower creatures may just not be complicated enough to give them much, much truth. Um, but as you get, you know, to 86 billion neurons, you can now compute the truth or at least the parts of the truth that we need. When, when I look at evolutionary game theory, um, one of my graduate students, Justin Mark, did some simulations using genetic algorithms. So there he was just exploring. What he found was that uh, basically you never even saw the, the, the truth organisms even come on the stage. They, 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 if they came up, they were gone in one generation. They just, they just weren't. So they, they, they came and got, they, they came and went, uh, even just in one generation, they, they just are not good enough. The ones that were just tracking their senses, just were tracking the fitness payoffs were, were far more, um, fit than, than, um, the truth seekers. So from, a, so an answer at, at one level, I'm going to give an answer at a deeper level, but just with evolutionary game theory. Because my attitude as a scientist is, um, I don't believe any of our theories. I take them very, very seriously. I study them. I look at their implications, but none of them are the gospel. They're just the latest ideas that we have. And you know, so the reason I study evolutionary game theory is because... <laughs> any of our current scientific theories, I am Dr. Nair about this. We should use the best tools we have right now. Mm -hmm. That's and what we've got. With, with humility. Well, so let me ask you about game theory. There's, um, I, I love game theory, uh, evolutionary game theory, um, but I'm always suspicious of it 
um, like economics. Um, when you construct models, it's too easy to construct things uh, that oversimplify just um, because we, our human brains, enjoy the, over, the simplification of constructing a few variables that somehow represent organisms or represent people. So I've gotten some pushback from professional colleagues and friends who have tried to rerun simulations and try to, I mean, the, the idea that we don't see the truth is not comfortable. And so many of my colleagues are very interested in trying to show that we're wrong. Mm -hmm. And so the idea would be to say that somehow we did something, as you're suggesting, maybe something special that wasn't completely general. Um, we got some little special part of the whole search space in evolutionary game theory in which this happens to be true, but more generally, organisms would evolve to see the truth. So the the, the best pushback we've gotten is from a team at Yale. And uh, they suggested that um, if you use thousands of payoff functions, so we, in our simulations, we just use a couple, mm -hmm. one or two, because it was our first simulations, right? So that would be a limit. We had one or two payoff functions. We showed the, the result in those, at least for the genetic algorithms. And they said, if you have 20,000 of them, then we can find these conditions in which um, truth-seeing see organisms would be the ones that, that evolved and, and survived. And so we looked at, at their simulations, and, and it, it certainly is the case that you can find special cases in which truth can evolve. So when I say it's probability zero, it doesn't mean it can't happen. It, mm -hmm. it, it can happen. In fact, it could happen infinitely often. It's just probability zero. So it, probability mm -hmm. zero things can happen infinitely mm -hmm. often. When you say probability is zero, you mean probability close to zero. To be very, very precise. So for example, if I have a unit square on the plane, um, and I use a measure in which the, um, on a probability measure in which the area of a region is this probability. Mm -hmm. Then if I draw a curve in that unit square, it has me measure precisely zero. Precisely, not approximately, precisely zero. Big. And so the tools of mathematics, you could sort of apply the same kind of criticism that it is a very convenient interface into well, our reality. That's a big debate in mathematics. The intuitionists versus the ones who take, for example, the real numbers uh, as, 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 as real. And that's a, that's a fun dis discussion. Nicholas Giesen has, a physicist, has really interesting work recently on how you, if you go with intuitionist mathematics, uh, you could effectively quantize Newton and you find that the uh, Newtonian theory and, and quantum theory aren't that different once you go with it. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's really quite interesting. So, yeah. so the, the issue you raise is a very, very deep one and one that I think we should take quite seriously, which is, you know, how should we think about the reality of the contours hierarchy, Aleph one, Aleph two, and all these, all these different um, infinities, versus um, just um, a more algorithmic approach, right? So where it's, it, everything's computable in some sense, and everything's finite, as big as you want, but 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 nevertheless finite. Um, so yeah, they bo ultimately boils down to whether the world is discrete or continuous in some general sense. And again, we can't really know, but there's just um, a mind-breaking thought, just common sense reasoning, that something can happen and is yet probability of it happening is 0%. That doesn't, that doesn't uh, compute for common sense computer. Right. Um, this is where you have to be, be a, a, a sharp mathematician to really, and I'm not. Sharp is one word. Sure. What I'm saying is common sense computer is, I, I mean that uh, in a very kind of, in a positive sense, because we've been talking about perception systems and interfaces. If we were, if we are to reason about the world, we have to use the best interfaces we got. And I'm not exactly sure uh, that game theory 
is the best interface we got for this. Oh, right. And, and the application of mathematics, uh, tricks and tools of mathematics to game theory is the best we got when we are thinking about the nature of reality right. and fitness functions and evolution, period. Right. Well, that's a, a fair rejoinder. And I think that um, th that was the tool that we used. And if if someone says, here's a better mathematical tool and here's why, this is this mathematical tool better captures the essence of Darwin's idea. John Maynard Smith didn't quite get it with evolutionary game theory. There's this better this thing. Now, there are tools like evolutionary graph theory, which generalize evolutionary game theory. And then there's quantum game theory. So so you can you can use uh, quantum tools like entanglement, for example, as as a resource in games that that change the very nature of of the solutions of the, the optimal solutions of, of the game theoretic. Well, the, the the work from Yale is really interesting. It's a really interesting challenge of that kind. Of Coding a convenient way of looking at various fitness payoffs. I can use this for drinking. Mm -hmm. I could use it as a weapon, not a very good one. I could beat someone over the head with it. Yeah. Um, if my goal is mating, this is pointless. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing for what I'm coding here is all sorts of actions and the payoffs that I could get. When I pick up an apple, now I'm getting a different set of actions and pay and, and payoffs for. When I pick up a rock, I'm getting so for every object, what I'm getting is a different set of payoff functions, um, and, and act with various actions. And so once you allow that, then what you find is once once again that uh, truth goes extinct, and the organisms that just get an interface are the ones that that win. But the question, uh, just sneaking up on, this is fascinating. From where do fitness functions originate? What gives birth to the fitness functions? So if there's a giant black box of, that just keeps giving you fitness functions, what are we trying to optimize? You said that water uh, has different uh, uses than an apple, so there's these objects. What are we trying to optimize? And why is not reality a really good generator of fitness functions? So each theory makes its own assumptions and says, grant me this, and I'll explain mm -hmm. that. So evolutionary game theory says, grant me fitness payoffs, right? And grant me strategies with payoffs and I can write down a matrix for this strategy interacts with that strategy. These are the payoffs that come up. If you grant me that, then I can start to to explain a lot of things. Now you can ask for a deeper question, like, okay, so how does physics evolve biology, and where do these fitness payoffs mm -hmm. come from? Right now, that would be a, that, that's a, a completely different enterprise, and of course, evolutionary game theory then would be not the, the right tool for that. It would have to be a deeper tool that shows where evolutionary game theory comes from. My own take is that there's gonna be a problem in doing that because space-time isn't fundamental. It's just a user interface. And that the distinction that we make between living and non-living is not a fundamental distinction. It's an artifact of the limits of our interface, right? So this is a new wrinkle, and this is an important wrinkle. What, it's so nice to take space and time as fundamental because if something looks like it's inanimate, it's, it's inanimate, and we can just say it's, it's not living. Now, it's much more complicated. Certain things are obviously living. I'm talking with you. I, there's, I'm obviously interacting with some, something that's alive and, and conscious. I think we've let go of the word obviously in this conversation. <laughs> I think nothing is obvious. Nothing's obvious, that's right. <laughs> but when we get down to, you know, to like you know, an ant, it's obviously living, but I'll say it, it, it appears to be living. Yeah. But when we get down to a virus, now people wonder. And when we get down to you know, protons, people say it's not living. And, and my attitude is, look, I have a user interface. The interface 
is there to hide certain aspects of reality and others to, uh, to, well, to, it's an uneven representation, put it that way. Certain things just get completely hidden. Dark matter and dark energy are most of the energy. <laughs> answer the question, the deep question you asked, I think the, the right way we're going to have to do that is to come up with a deeper theory than space-time, in which there may not be the notion of time, and show that whatever this, the dynamics of that deeper theory is, and by the way, I'll talk about how you could have dynamics without time, but the, the dynamics of this deeper theory, when we project it into in certain ways, then we do get space-time and we get what appears to be evolution by natural selection. So I would love to see evolution by natural selection, nature red in tooth and claw, people fighting and animals fighting for resources and the whole bit, come out of a deeper theory in which perhaps it's all cooperation. There's no, no limited resources and so forth. But as a result of projection, you get space and time. And as a result of projection, you get nature red in tooth and claw. that somehow interacts, that uh, over time maintains its integrity somehow, uh, it has some kind of history, it has a wall of some kind, the outside world, the environment, and then inside there's an organism. Mm -hmm. So you're defining an organism, and also you define that organism by the fact that it can move, and it can be come alive, which you kind of think of as moving, combined with the fact that it's keeping itself separate from the environment, so you can point out that thing is living, and then it can also die. Uh, that seems to be of all very powerful components of space-time that enable you to have something like natural selection and, uh, and evolution. Um, well, and there's a lot of interesting work, some of it um, by collaborators of Carl Friston and, and others, where they, yes. they have um, Bayes net kind of stuff that they build on and the notion of a Markov blanket. So you have some states within this network that are inside the blanket, then you have the blanket and then the states outside the blanket. And the states inside this Markov blanket are conditionally independent of the states outside the blank blanket conditioned on the blanket. And what they're, what they're looking at is that the dynamics inside of the states inside the Markov blanket seem to be trying to estimate properties of the outside and, and, and react to them in a way. So it seems like you're doing probabilistic inferences in ways that might be able to, to, to keep you alive. So there's interesting work. That symbol. But I don't delete you. I don't delete the conscious experience, the, the, the whole world of your... So I, I'm, I'm only deleting an interface symbol. But that interface symbol is a portal, so to speak. Uh, not a perfect portal, but a, a genuine portal into your beliefs, into your conscious experiences, into... That's why we can have a conversation. We, we genuinely... Your consciousness is genuinely affecting mine, and mine is genuinely affecting yours through these icons, which, which I create on the fly. I, I mean, I create your face when I look, I delete it. I don't create you, your consciousness. That's there all the time. Um, but, but I do, so now when, when I look at a cat, I'm creating something that I still call living and I, I still think is conscious. When I look at an ant, I create something that I still would call living, but maybe not conscious. When I, when I look at something I call a virus, now I'm not even sure I would call it living. And when I look at a proton, I would say, I'm, I don't even think it, it, it's, it's not alive at all. It could be that I'm nevertheless interacting with something that's just as conscious as you. I'm not saying the proton is conscious. The face that I'm creating when I look at you, that face is not conscious. That face is a data structure in me. That face is it's an experience. It's not an experiencer. Sim similarly, a proton is, is, is something that I create you know, when I look or do a collision in the Large Hadron Collider or something like that. But what is behind the entity in space-time? So the, I've got this space-time interface, and I've just got this entity that I call a proton. What is the reality behind it? Well, the physicists are finding 
these big, big structures, amplitudehedron, the sociohedron, what's behind those? Could be consciousness, what I'm playing with. In which case, when I'm interacting with a proton, I could be interacting with consciousness. Again, to be very, very clear, because it's easy to misunderstand, I'm not saying a proton is conscious. Just like I'm not saying your face is conscious. Your face is a symbol I create and then delete as I look. And, so your face is not conscious, but I know that that face in my interface, the, the Lex Friedman face that I create, is an interface symbol that's a genuine portal into your consciousness. The portal is, is less clear for a cat, even less clear, clear for an ant. And by the time we get down to a proton, the portal is not clear at all. But that doesn't mean I'm not interacting with consciousness. It just means my interface gave up. And there's some some deeper reality that we have to go after. So so that so your question really forces out a, a big part of this whole approach that I'm talking about. So it's this portal and conscious. I wonder why you can't your portal is not as good to a cat to the cat's consciousness than it is to a human. Does it have to be have to do with the fact that you're human and just similar organisms? Organisms of similar co complexity are able to create portals better to each other, or is it just as you get more and more complex, you get better and better portals? Well, let me answer one one aspect yes. of it that, that I'm more confident about, then I'll speculate on that. Why is why is it that the portal is so bad with protons? Well, and and and, and elementary particles more generally, so quarks, leptons, and gluons, and so forth. <clears throat> well, the reason for that is because those are just symmetries of space-time. More technically, they're irreducible representations of the Poincaré group of space-time. So they're just literally representations of the data structure of space-time that we're using. So that's why they're not very much insightful. They're, they're just almost entirely tied to the data structure itself. There's, there's not much... They're telling you only something about the data structure, not behind the data structure. It's only when we get to higher levels that we're starting to, in some sense, build portals to what's behind space-time. Sure. Yeah. So there's more and more um, complexity built on top of the interface of space-time with the cat. So you can actually build a portal, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although, yeah, right. Uh yeah, I this interface of face and hair and so on, skin. There is some syncing going on between humans, though, where we sync. Like you're you're getting a pretty good representation of the ideas in my head, and starting to get a foggy view of uh, my memories in my head. Mm -hmm. The yes, there's a lot of work on this. So there's some interesting work called signaling games where they, they look at how people can coordinate. In kind of insight that, that there's going to be, again, a game, perhaps a game or evolutionary or genetic algorithm kind of thing that goes on in terms of learning to communicate in ways that, that are useful. And uh, so, yeah, you can use game theory to, to actually explore that or signaling games. Um, there's a lot of brilliant work on that. I'm not doing it, but it, there's work out there. So if it's okay, let us tackle once more and perhaps several more times after the big topic of consciousness. Okay. This, this very beautiful, powerful things that perhaps is the thing that makes us human. What is it? What's the role of consciousness in, um, let's say, even just the thing we've been talking about, which is the formation of this interface? Um, any kind of ways you want to kind of start sure. uh, talking, uh, talking about it? Well, let me s say first what most of my colleagues say. 99% are, again, assuming that space-time is fundamental. Particles in space-time, matter is fundamental. And most are reductionist. And so the standard approach to consciousness is to figure out what 
complicated systems of matter with the right functional properties could possibly lead to the emergence of consciousness. That's the general idea, right? So maybe you have to have neurons. Maybe only if you have neurons, but that might not be enough. They have to certain kinds of complexity in their, their organization and their dynamics, certain kind of network abilities, for example. So there's, there are those who say, for example, that um, consciousness arises from orchestrated collapse of quantum states of microtubules and neurons. So, mm -hmm. so this is Hamroff and Penrose have this kind of, so it's... <laughs> You might say, well, in addition to the, the particles in space and time, those particles are not just matter, they also could have, say, a unit of consciousness. Um, and so, but once again, you're taking space and time and particles as fundamental, and you're adding um, a new property to them, say, the consciousness. And then you have to talk about how when a proton and a neutron uh, where proton and electron get together to form hydrogen, then how those consciousnesses merge to or interact to create the consciousness of, of hydrogen and so forth. Um, there's a tension schema theory, which again, this is how neural network processes representing to the network itself, its attentional processes, that could be consciousness. Um, there's global workspace theory. Uh, and neuronal global workspace theory. So there's many, many theories of this type. What's, what's common to all of them is they assume that space-time is fundamental. They assume that physical processes in space-time is fundamental. Panpsychism adds consciousness as an additional thing. It's almost dualist in that re regard. And my attitude is our best science is telling us that space-time is not fundamental. So, idea. They, nothing was more elemental than those, and you could you could sort of build everything up from those. When we got the periodic table of elements, we realized that, um, of, of course, we want to study earth, air, fire, and water. There's combustion science for fire. There's you know, um, there's sciences for for all these other things, water and so forth. So we're going to do science with these things, but, but fundamental, no, no. If, if you're looking for something fundamental. <laughs> model of physics. And, and, and so we actually now know that if you really want to get fundamental, the periodic table isn't it. It's good for chemistry. And it's just wonderful for chemistry. But if you're trying to go deep, fundamental. What is the fundamental science? That's not it. You're going to have to go to quarks, leptons, and gluons, and so forth. Well, now we've discovered space-time itself is doomed. Quarks, leptons, and gluons are just irreducible representations of the symmetries of space-time. So the whole framework on which consciousness research is being based right now is doomed. And for me, th these are my friends and colleagues that are doing this. They're brilliant. They're absolutely, they're, they're, they're brilliant. I, my feeling is I, I'm so sad. Is reality, uh, the way we perceive it, doomed, um, wrong, or fake because doomed just means it could still be right and we're now ready to go deeper it would uh, be that so r it's not wrong it's not a complete deviation from a journey toward the truth r right it's like earth air fire and water is not wrong there is earth air fire and water that's a useful framework but it's not fundamental Right. Well, there's also wrong, which is they used to believe, as I recently learned, that George Washington was uh, the president, the, the first president of the United States, was bled to death uh, for something that could have been easily treated uh, because it was believed that you can get, uh, actually, I need to look into this further, but I guess you get 
toxins out or demons out. I don't know what you're getting out with the bleeding of a person. Right. Um, but so that ended up being wrong, but widely believed as a medical tool. So it's also possible that our assumption of space time is not just doomed, but is wrong. Well, if we believe that it's fundamental, that's wrong. But if we believe it's a useful tool, that's right. But he could see, but bleeding somebody to death was believed to be a useful tool. And that and was it, wrong. It wasn't just not fundamental. Right. It was very, uh, I'm sure there's cases in which bleeding somebody would work, but it would be a very tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of cases. Uh, so it could be that it's wrong. Like it's a side road that's ultimately leading to a dead end as opposed to a truck stop or something that you can get off of. <laughs> my, my feeling is, is not the dead end kind of thing. I, I think that the what the physicists are finding is that there are these structures beyond space-time, but they project back into space-time. And so space-time, when they, when they say space-time is doomed, they're explicit. They're saying it's doomed in the sense that we thought it was fundamental. It's not fundamental. Right. It's a useful, absolutely useful and brilliant data structure. But there are deeper data structures like cosmological polytope. And, and, and space-time is not fundamental. What is doomed in the sense that it's wrong is reductionism. Which that, is saying space-time is fundamental. Right, right. The idea that, that somehow s being smaller in space and time or space time is a fundamental nature of reality. That's is a that's that's just wrong. It turned out to be a useful heuristic for for thermodynamics and so forth, and and several other places. It, reductionism has been very useful, but that's in some sense an artifact of how we use our interface. Um, yeah, so you're saying size doesn't matter. Okay, this is very important for me to ultimately, write down. Ulti ultimately, ultimately, right? I mean, right. it's useful. <laughs> For, for theories like thermodynamics yes. and also for understanding brain networks in terms of, of n individual neurons and neurons in terms of, of chemical systems inside cells, that's all very, very useful. But, but the idea that we're getting to the more fundamental nature of reality, no. When you, when you get all the way down in that direction, you get down to the quarks and gluons, and what you realize is what you've gotten down to is not fundamental reality, just the irreducible representations of a data structure. That's all you've gotten down to. So you're always stuck inside the data structure. So you seem to be getting closer and closer. I, mean, I went from neural networks to neurons, to neurons to chemistry, chemistry to particles, particles to quarks and gluons. I'm getting closer and closer to the real. No, I'm getting closer and closer to the the actual structure of the data structure of space and time, the irreducible representations. Of it. That's what you're getting closer to, not to a deeper understanding of what's beyond space time. We'll also refer. We'll return again to this question of dynamics, because. You And if you think about it, there's lots of things that you might want to write down about consciousness. It's a really complicated subject. Um, so most of my colleagues are saying, let's start with matter or neurons and, and um, see what properties of matter could create consciousness. But I'm saying that that whole thing is out. Space-time is doomed. That whole thing is out. We need to look at consciousness qua consciousness. In other words, not as something that arises in space and time but perhaps it's something that creates space and time as a data structure. So what do we want? And here, again, th there's no hard and fast rule, but what you as a scientist have to do is to pick what you think are the minimal assumptions that are going to allow you to boot up a comprehensive theory. That is the trick. So what do I want? So what, what I chose to do was to have three things. I said that there are conscious experiences. Feeling of headache, the smell of garlic, um, experiencing the color red. There are, those are conscious. So that's a primitive of a theory. And the reason I want few primitives, why? Because those are the miracles of the theory, right? The primitives, the assumptions of the theory are the things you're not going to explain. Those are the things you assume. And those experiences you particularly mean there, there's a subjectiveness to them. 
That's what's the thing when people refer to the hard problem of consciousness is it feels like something to look at the color red. Okay. Exactly right. It feels like something to have a headache or to, or to feel upset to your stomach. It, it feels like something. And so, though, so I'm going to grant that in this theory, there are experiences and they're fundamental in some sense. So conscious experience. So they're not derived from physics. They're not functional properties of particles. They are sui generis. <laughs> Or is there something about in relation to other kinds of organisms that have a sufficiently high level of complexity? Or even, uh, or is there some kind of uh, generalization of the panpsychist idea that all, all consciousness permeates all matter outside of the usual definition of what matter is inside space time? So it's. Beyond human consciousness, human consciousness, from my point of view, would be one of a, a countless variety of consciousnesses. And even within human consciousness, there's a there's countless variety of consciousnesses within us, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have your left and right hemisphere, and apparently, if you split the corpus callosum, the the personality of the left hemisphere and the religious beliefs of the left hemisphere can be very different from the right hemisphere, and their conscious experiences can be disjoint. One could have one conscious experience. They can play 20 questions. The left hemisphere can have an idea in its mind, and the right hemisphere has to guess, and it might not get it. So so even within you, there is it's more than just one consciousness. It's lots of consciousnesses. So I the, the general theory of consciousness that I'm after is not just human consciousness. It's going to be just consciousness, and I presume human consciousness is a tiny drop in the bucket of the infinite variety of consciousnesses. That, that said, I should clarify that <clears throat> the black hole of consciousness is uh, the, the the home cat. I'm pretty sure cats lack, uh, is the embodiment of evil and, and lack all capacity for consciousness or uh, compassion. So I just want to lay that on the table. But that's the theory I'm working I, I don't have any good evidence. But <laughs> the black cat. <laughs> into it. That's just a shout out to <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry to distract. So that's the first assumption. The first assumption. That's yeah. right. The, the second assumption is that these experiences have consequences. So I'm going to say that conscious experiences can trigger other conscious experiences somehow. So, so really, in some sense, there there's two basic assumptions. There are so there's some kind of ca causality. Is there is a chain of causality? <clears throat> Does this relate to dynamics? I'll say there's a probabilistic relationship. Okay. Um, and, and then, so I'm trying to be as nonspecific to begin with and see where it, it leads me. So what I can write down are probability spaces. So a probability space, which contains the conscious experiences that this consciousness can have. So I, I'll, I call this a conscious agent, this technical thing. No, I... I Annika Harris and I have talked about this, and, and she rightly cautions me that people will think that I'm bringing in a notion of a self or agency and, or, and so forth when I say conscious agent. So I just want to say that I use the term conscious agent merely as a technical term. There is no notion of self in my fundamental definition. Of <laughs> the experiences of other conscious agents, okay. including itself. But you don't think of that as a self. No, there there is no notion of of a self here. There's no notion of of really of an agent. But is there a locality? Is there an There's organism? No space. There's no. <laughs> okay. So this is this is um, these are conscious units, conscious entities. But they're distinct in some way because they have to interact. Well, so here's the interesting thing. When we write down the mathematics, um, when you have two of these conscious agents interacting, they, the, the pair space. Yeah. It's, it's a scale-free, or if, if you like, a fractal-like mm -hmm. approach to it in which we can use the same unit of analysis at all scales in, in studying consciousness. But if I want to talk about 
so there's no notion of learning, memory, problem solving, intelligence, self, agency. So none of that is fundamental. So, and the reason I did that was because I want to assume as little as possible. Everything that we can do with neural networks or, you know, automata, you can do with networks of conscious agents. That's trivial. What, but you can also do more. The events in the probability space need not be computable. So the Markovian dynamics is not restricted to computable functions because the very events themselves need not be computable. So, so this can capture any computable theory, anything we can do with neural If we want a theory of, of memory, we have to build it. And there's lots of different ways you could build. We've actually got a paper, Chris Fields took the lead on this and he, he we have a paper called Conscious Agent Networks where, where Chris takes the lead and shows how to use these networks of conscious agents to build memory and to build the primitive kinds of, of, of learning. But can you uh, provide some intuition of what conscious networks, network of conscious, networks of conscious agents helps you, well, first of all, what that looks like? Uh, and I don't just mean mathematically, of course, maybe that might help build up intuition, but how that helps us potentially solve the hard problem of consciousness. Right. Or is that baked in, that that exists? I, I, is the, the, can you solve the hard problem of consciousness? Why it tastes delicious when you eat a delicious ice cream uh, with uh, networks of conscious agents? Or is that taken as, as an assumption? So the, the standard way the hard problem is thought of is we're assuming space and time and particles or neurons, for example. These are just physical things that, that have no consciousness. And we have to explain how the conscious experience of the taste of chocolate could emerge from those. So that's the, the typical hard problem of consciousness is that problem, right? How do you boot... <laughs> If you looked, you would see neurons. That's a data structure that you would create on the fly. And it's a very useful one. As soon as you look away, you garbage collect that data structure. Just like that Necker cube that I was talking about on the piece of paper. When you look, you see a 3D cube. You create it on the fly. As soon as you look away, that's gone. When you say you, you mean a human being scientist. Right now, that's right. More generally, it'll be conscious agents, because as you, as you pointed out in my asking for a theory of consciousness only about humans, no, it's, it's how many other data structures are there? That's why I said you human, if there's another earth, if there's another alien civilization and doing these kinds of investigations, would they come up with similar data structures? Probably like, not. What is the space of data structures, I guess, is what I'm asking. Um, my, uh, my, my guess is that if consciousness is fundamental, if consciousness is all there is, then the only thing that mathematical structure can be about is possibilities of consciousness. And that suggests to me that there could be an infinite variety of consciousnesses and a, a, a vanishingly small fraction of them use space-time data structures and the kinds of structures that we use. There's an infinite variety of data structures. Now, this is very similar to something that Max Tegmark has said, but I want to distinguish it. He has this, his level four uh, multiverse idea. He, he thinks that mathematics is fundamental. And, and so that's the fundamental reality. And, and since there's an infinite variety of endless variety of mathematical structures, there's an infinite variety of multiverses in his view. Mm -hmm. I'm saying something similar in spirit, but importantly different. There's an infinite variety of ma mathematical structures, absolutely. But mathematics isn't the fundamental reality in this, in this framework. Consciousness is. And mathematics is to consciousness like bones are to an organism. You need the bones. So mathematics is is not divorced from consciousness, but it's not, 
the entirety of consciousness by any means. And so there's an infinite variety of... of And Kimberly Jameson and uh, others who've studied these women have good evidence that they apparently have a new dimension of color experience that the rest of us don't have. So, so these women are apparently living in a world of color that you and I can't even concretely imagine. No man can imagine them. Yeah. And, and yet th they're real color experiences. And so in that sense, I'm saying, now take that little baby step. Oh, there are women who have color experiences that I could never have. Well, that's shocking. Now take that infinite. There are consciousnesses where every aspect of their, their experiences are, is like that new color. It's something utterly alien to you. You, you have nothing like that. And yet these are all possible varieties of conscious experience. When you say there's a lot of consciousnesses, it's a singular consciousness, basically the set of possible How dynamical systems of conscious agents could lead to what we call space and time and neurons mm -hmm. and brain activity. In other words, we have to show how you get space, time, and physical objects in, entirely from a theory of conscious agents outside of space-time, with, with the dynamics outside of space-time. So that's, that's, and I can tell you how we plan to, to, to do that, but, but that's, yeah, the, that's the idea. Okay, the, the magic of it, the chocolate is delicious. So, so there's a mathematical kind of thing that we could say here, how it can emerge within the system of uh, networks of conscious agents, but um, is there going to be at the end of, of the proof why chocolate is so delicious or or no? I guess I'm, I'm going to ask different kinds of dumb questions to try to sneak sure. up. Sure. Oh, well, that's the right question. And when I say that I took conscious experiences as fundamental, what that means is in the current version of my theory, I'm not explaining conscious experiences where they came from. That's the miracle. That's one of the miracles. So I have two miracles in my theory. There are conscious experiences like the taste of chocolate and that the there's a probabilistic relationship. When certain conscious experiences occur, others are more likely to occur. Those are the two miracles that, it's that are possible I'm, to so. get beyond that and somehow start to chip away at the miracleness of that miracle. That chocolate is still delicious. I hope so. I've got my hands full with what I'm doing right now, but but the uh, I can just say at a top level how I would think about that. That would get at this consciousness without form. Uh, this, this is going to be really, this is really tough because it's consciousness without form versus the various forms that consciousness takes for the experiences that it has. Right, right. So there's, so when I write down a probability space for these conscious experiences, I say, here's a probability space for the possible conscious experiences. It's just like when I write down a probability space for infinity, <laughs> uh, but along that long journey of intelligent species, how when will we solve this consciousness one? Which is one way to measure the difficulty of the problem. So I'll give two answers. There's one problem I think we can solve, but we haven't solved yet, and that is the reverse of what my colleagues call the hard problem. The problem of how do you start with conscious experiences in the way that I've just described them and the dynamics and build up space and time and brains, that I think is a tough technical problem, but it's in principle solvable. So I think we can solve that. So we would solve the hard problem, not by showing how brains create consciousness, but how networks of conscious agents create what we call the, the symbols that we call brains. So that, that I think... But that does that allow you to? So that's interesting. That's an interesting idea. <laughs> consciousness creates the brain, not the brain creates consciousness. Right. But does that allow you to build? The physicists are finding, like the amplitude hedron. 
But the other, but the other answer to your question is less positive. I, as I said earlier, I think that there is no such thing as a theory of everything. So that I think that my, the theory that my team is working on, this conscious agent theory, is just a 1.0 theory. Theory. We're using probability spaces and Markovian kernels. I can easily see people now saying, well, we can do better if we go to category theory. And we can do, get a, a deeper, perhaps more interesting. And then someone will say, well, now I'll go to topoi theory. And then there'll be, so I, I imagine that there'll be, you know, conscious agents, five, 10, three trillion, point oh. But I think it will never end. I think ultimately this question that, that we sort of put our fingers on of how does the formless give birth to form? To the taste, the wonderful taste of chocolate. I think that we will always go deeper and deeper, but we will never solve that. That that in some sense that will be a primitive. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> maybe I'm. I, maybe it's just the the limits of my current imagination. Um, so I'll, I'll just say my my imagination right now doesn't peer that deep. Hopefully, so I don't, by the way, I'm saying this, I don't want to discourage some brilliant 20-year-old who then later on proves me dead wrong. I, I hope to be proven dead wrong. Well, just like you said, essentially from now, everything we're saying now, everything you're saying, all of your theories will be laughing stock. Yeah. They will respect the, uh, the, the, the puzzle solving abilities and how, how much we were able to do with so little, but uh, outside of that, it will all be just uh, the silliness will be entertainment for a teenager, especially the class. silliness when we thought that we were so smart and we knew it yeah. all. <laughs> so it would be interesting to explore your ideas by contrasting. You mentioned Annika, Annika Harris. You mentioned um, Philip Goff. So outside of if you're not allowed to say the fundamental disagreement is the fact that space time is fundamental. Um, what are interesting dis distinctions between ideas of consciousness between you and Annika, for example? You guys have, uh, um, you've been on a podcast together. I'm sure in, 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 in private, you guys have some. She has really, um, more been very helpful in, in helping me to be a little bit clear about these ideas and not say things that are misleading. So, sure. The word, I mean, this is the interesting thing about language, actually, is that language, quite obviously, is an interface yes. in, um, to truth. It's, it's so fascinating that individual words can have so much um, ambiguity and the, the, and the slight, the specific choices of a word within a particular sentence within the context of a sentence can have so much uh, such a difference in meaning it's quite fascinating especially when you're talking about topics like consciousness because it's a very loaded term it means a lot of things to a lot of people and the entire concept is shrouded in a mystery so co combination of the fact that it's a loaded term and that there's a lot of mystery People can just interpret it in all kinds of ways. And so you have to be both precise and help them avoid getting um, stuck on, on some kind of side road of miscommunication, lost in translation because you used the wrong word. That's interesting. I mean, because for, for a lot of people, consciousness is ultimately connected to a self. I mean... That's our our experience of consciousness is very it's connected to this ego. I mean, I just I mean, what else could it possibly be? I can't even how do you begin to comprehend to, to visualize to conceptualize a consciousness that's not connected to like this particular organism? Well, I have a a way of thinking about this whole problem now that's that's that comes out of this this framework that's different. So we can imagine a, a dynamics of consciousness 
not in space and time, just abstractly. It could be cooperative, for all we know. It could be very friendly. I, I don't know. But it, and you can set up a dynamics, a Markovian dynamics, that is so-called stationary. And that's a technical... <laughs> And in that sense, the dynamics is timeless. There is no entropic time. But it's a trivial theorem, three-line proof, that if you have a stationary Markovian dynamics, any projection that you make of that dynamics by conditional probability, and if, if you want, I can state a little bit more, even more mathematically precisely for, for some readers or listeners. But if any projection you take by conditional probability, the induced image of that Markov chain will have increasing entropy. You will have entropic time. So so I'll, I'll be very, very precise. I have a Markov ch chain X1, X2 through Xn, where Xn n goes to infinity, right? Mm -hmm. The entropy H, capital H, of Xn is equal to the entropy H of Xn minus one for all N. Mm -hmm. So the entropy is the same, but it's a, it's a theorem that is equal to H of Xn um, given X2, Xn minus one given X2 by the Markov property. And then, because it's stationary, it's equal to a, a, H of X. Um, um, I have to write it down. X yeah, my, sure, sure. Uh, I have to write it down. Anyway, th there's a three-line proof. Sure. So, what the, the, but the assumption of stationarity, we're, we're using a lot of terms that people won't understand. Right, right. Doesn't, doesn't matter. The, uh, so, so, so there's some kind of, so Markovian dynamics is... Uh, basically trying to model some kind of system with some probabilities and there's agents and they interact in some kind of way and you could say something. ...and see, okay, well, what is, what is the system's behave like under these different properties? The, the more constraints, the more assumptions you take, the more predictive, the more interesting, powerful things you can say, but sometimes they're limiting. That said, we're talking about consciousness here. <laughs> How does that, you said cooperative, okay, competitive. It just, I like chocolate. I'm sitting here, I have a brain, I'm wearing a suit. It sure as hell feels like I'm a self. Right. Uh, what, am I tuning in? Am I plugging into something? Am I a projection, a, s a simple, trivial projection into space-time from some much larger organism that I can't possibly comprehend? How the hell, so you're saying some, yes. you're building up mathematical intuitions, fine, great, but I'm just, I'm, I'm having an existential crisis here and I'm gonna die soon. We'll all die pretty quickly, so I, I wanna, f I want to figure out why chocolate is so delicious. Uh, so help me out here. So let's just keep sneaking up to this. Uh, right. So the whole technical, technical thing was to say this. Even if the dynamics of consciousness is stationary, so that there is no entropic time, any projection of it, any view of it, will have the artifact of entropic time. That's a limited resource. Limited resources. So the, the fundamental dynamics may have no limits, limited resources whatsoever. Any projection will have certainly time as a limited resource and probably a lot of other limited resources. Hence, we could get competition and evolution and nature red and tooth and claw as an artifact of a deeper system in which those aren't fundamental. And, and in fact, I take it as something that this theory must do at some point is to show how networks of conscious agents, even if they're not resource limited, give rise to evolution by natural selection via a projection. Yeah, but you're saying, I'm, tr I'm trying to understand how the limited resources that give rise to, um, so, so first the thing gives rise to time, that gives rise to limited resource, that gives rise to 
evolution by natural selection, how that has to do with the fact that chocolate is delicious? Well, well, it's, it's not going to do that directly. It's going to get to this notion of self. My guess is I'll be able to show, or, the, or the, my brighter colleagues working with me will be able to show, that, that we will get evolution of a natural selection, the notion of individual selves, individual physical objects, and so forth coming out as a projection of this thing. And, and, and that the self, this then will be, be really interesting in terms of how it starts to interact with certain um, spiritual traditions, right? Where they will say that there is a notion of self that needs to be let go, which is this finite self that's competing with other selves to you know, get more money and, and prestige and so forth. That self, in some sense, has to die. But there's a deeper self, which is the timeless um, being um, that, pre preclude, that precedes, not precludes, but precedes um, any particular conscious experiences, the, the ground of all experience. That There's that notion of a deep capital self. But our little capital, lowercase s selves could be artifacts of projection. And <clears throat> it may be that what consciousness is doing in this framework is, right, it's, it's projected itself down into a self that calls itself Don and a self that calls itself Lex. And through conversations like this, it's trying to find out about itself and eventually transcend the limits of the Don and Lex little icons that it's using and, and that little projection of itself. Through this con conversation, it's somehow it, it's learning about itself. So that, that thing dressed me up today. Is there, is there somebody like that um, that over the years has been a source of disagreement with you that strengthened your ideas? Mm. My ideas have been really shaped by uh, several things. One is um, the physicalist framework that my scientific colleagues, almost to a person, have adopted and that I adopted too. Until I, the reason I, I walked away from it was because I, I uh, it, it became clear that we couldn't start with unconscious ingredients and boot up consciousness. Can you define physicalist oh, with res, uh, oh, physicalist. in contrast to reductionist? So a, a, a physicalist, I, I would say, is someone who takes space time and the objects within space time as ontologically fundamental. Right, and then reductionist is saying the smaller, the more fundamental. That's a methodological thing. That's that's saying within space time, as you go to smaller and smaller scales in space, you get deeper and deeper laws, more more and more fundamental laws. And you know the reduction of temperature to particle mo movement was an example of that. But I think that 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 the reason that worked was. Uh, almost an artifact of the nature of our interface. That was for a long time, and you, your colleagues, including yourself, were physicalists, and now you broke away. I broke away because I think you can't start with unconscious ingredients and boot up consciousness. And so even with Roger Penrose, where there's like a gray area. Right. And here's the, the challenge I would put to, to all of my friends um, and colleagues who are... You know, Give one specific conscious experience that you can boot up, right? So if you think that it's integrated information, and this I've asked this of Julio Tononi a couple times back in the '90s, and then just a couple years ago, I asked Julio, "Okay, so great integrated information." Be for chocolate, and why? Why is it that it could not possibly be vanilla? Is there any, I asked him, is there any one specific conscious experience that, that you can account for? Because notice, they've set themselves the task of booting up conscious experiences from physical systems. That's yeah. the task they've set themselves. But that doesn't mean they're, uh, I, I understand your intuition, but that doesn't mean they're wrong just because they can't find a way to boot it up yet. That's right. No, that doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just, it just means that um, they haven't, done it 
I think it's principled. The reason is principled, but but I'm happy that they're exploring it. But the fact is, the, re the remarkable fact is there's not one theory. So integrated information theory, uh, orchestrated collapse of microtubules, um, global workspace theory. These are all theories of consciousness. These are all theories of consciousness. There's not a single theory that can give you a specific conscious experience that they say, here is the physical dynamics or the physical structure that must be the taste of chocolate or whatever one they want. So you're saying it's impossible. They're saying it's just hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I, <laughs> my attitude is, okay, uh, no one said you had to start with neurons or physical right. systems and boot up consciousness. You guys are just taking you that. You chose that problem. <laughs> So since you chose that problem, how much progress have you made? Well, when you've not been able to come up with a single specific conscious experience, and you've had these brilliant people working on it for decades now, that's not really good progress. Let me uh, ask you to be to play devil's advocate. Can you try to steel man, steel man meaning argue the best possible case for reality? The opposite of your book title. So, um, or maybe just sticking to consciousness. Can you take the physicalist view? C can you steal man the physicalist view for a brief moment, playing devil's advocate to, or? If it were true that space time was fundamental, then I would have to agree that if there is such a thing as consciousness, Given the data that we've got, that you know, com complex brains have consciousness and you know, dirt doesn't. That somehow it's the complexity of the dynamics or organization, uh, the function of the physical system that somehow is creating the consciousness. Um, so, under those assumptions, yes. But when the physicists themselves are telling us that space time is not fundamental, then I can understand. See, then the whole picture starts to come into focus. Why my my colleagues are brilliant, right? These are really smart people. I mean, Francis Crick worked on this for the last twenty years of his life. I mean, these are not stupid people. These are brilliant, brilliant people. The fact that we've come up with not a single specific conscious experience that we can explain, and no hope. There, there's there's no one that says oh, I'm really close. So I'll, I'll have it for you. And he likes the global workspace theory. But he says the last dollop of the theory in which, you know, there's something it's like to, he says, we may have to just stipulate that as a, as a brute fact. I mean, he, that's, I mean, that, when, and Pinker is brilliant, right? He, he's, he understands the state of play on this problem of the hard problem of consciousness, starting with physicalist assumptions and then trying to boot up consciousness. And you've set yourself the problem I'm starting with physical stuff that's not a, that's not conscious. I'm trying to get the taste of chocolate out as maybe some kind of function of the, of the dynamics of that. We've not been able to do that. And so Pinker is saying we may have to punt. We may have to just stipulate that last bit. The, he calls it the, the last dollop. Um, and just say stipulate it as a bare fact of nature that there is something that's like, well, from my point of view as the physical, the whole point, the whole promise of the physicalist was we wouldn't have to stipulate. I was going to start with the physical stuff and explain where the consciousness came from. If if I'm going to stipulate consciousness, I would go with Pinker and say, look, let's just stipulate the consciousness stuff, but I'm not going to stipulate the physical stuff. I'm going to actually now show how to boot up the physical stuff from just the consciousness stuff. So I'll stipulate less. Is it possible, so if you stipulate less, is it possible for our, our limited brains to visualize reality as we delve deeper and deeper and deeper? Is it possible to visualize somehow with the tools of math, with the tools of computers, with the tools of our mind, are we hopelessly lost? You, you said there's ways to intuit... Um, what's true using mathematics and probability and uh, sort of uh, a Markovian dynamics, all that kind of stuff. But that's not visualizing. That's what's a kind of 
building intuition, but is it possible to visualize in the way we visualize so nicely in, in space time in four dimensions in two in three dimensions sorry well two we really are looking through a two dimensional screen onto what we intuit to be a three dimensional world and in also inferring dynamic stuff making it 4d anyway is it possible to visualize some pretty pictures that give us a deeper sense of the truth of reality i think that we will incrementally be able to do that i think that for example the picture that we have of electrons and photons interacting and scattering mm -hmm. wasn't it may have not been possible until faraday did all of his experiments and then maxwell wrote down his equations and and we were then sort of forced by his equations to think in a new way and then then when Planck in 1900, you know, desperate to try to solve the the problem of black body radiation, the, what they call the ultraviolet <laughs> math, they're not contradictory, but still, certainly you wouldn't have gone there. And so here's a case where the experiments, and then a desperate mathematical move, sort of we use those as a flashlight into the deep fog, right? We're, we're, and, and so that science may be um, the flashlight into the deep fog. I wonder if it's still possible to visualize in the, in the like uh, we talk about consciousness in, from a self perspective, experience it, hold that idea in our mind, the way you can experience things directly. We've evolved to experience things in this 3D world. And that's that's a very rich experience. When you're thinking mathematically, uh, you still, in the end of the day, have to project it down to a uh, low dimensional space to make, to make conclusions. Their conclusions will be a number, or a line, or a plot, or a visual. So I wonder like how we can really touch some deep truth in a, in a subjective way, like experience it, really feel the beauty of it, you know, in the way that humans feel beauty. Right. Are we screwed? I don't think we're screwed. I, I think that we, we get little hints of it from, from psychedelic drugs and so forth. We, we get hints that there are certain interventions that we can take on our interface. I apply this chemical, which is just some element of my interface, to this other, to a brain, I ingest it. And all of a sudden, I, I seem like I've opened new portals into conscious experiences. Well, that's very, very suggestive. That's like um, the black body radiation doing something that we didn't expect, right? It, it doesn't go to infinity when we thought it was gonna go to infinity and we're forced to propose these quanta. So, once we have a theory of conscious agents and is projection into space done, I should say, I should sketch what I think that projection is. Um, mm -hmm. But then I think we can then start to ask specific questions. When, when you're taking DMT or you're taking LSD or something like that, um, now that we have this deep model that we've reverse engineered space and time and physical par particles. We've pulled them back to this theory of conscious agents. Now we can ask ourselves in this idealized future, um, what are we doing to conscious agents when we apply 5-MeO-DMT? What, what are we doing? Are we opening a new portal, right? So when I say that, I mean, I have a portal into consciousness that I call my body of Lex Friedman that I'm creating. And it's a genuine portal not perfect, but it's a genuine portal. I'm definitely communicating with your consciousness. And we know that we have one technology for building new portals. We know one technology, and that is having kids. Having kids is how we build new portals into consciousness. It takes a long time. Can you elaborate that? Uh, oh, 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 you mean like... Yeah. Uh, your your okay. son and your daughter didn't exist. That was a portal. Though you're having contact with consciousness, 
that you never would have had before. But now you've got a son or a daughter. It, you had you went through this physical process. They were born. Then you there was all the but training. is that portal yours? So when you have kids, are you creating new portals that are completely distinct from the portals that you've created with other consciousness? Like, can you can you elaborate on that? To which degree is are the consciousness of your kids a part of you? Well, so every person that I see, that symbol that I see, the body that I see, is is a portal potentially for me to interact with with a consciousness. Yeah. Um, and and each consciousness has a unique character. We call it a personality, right. and so forth. So, with each new kid that's born, we come in contact with a, a personality that we've never seen before, and, and a, a version of consciousness that we've never seen before. At a deeper level, as I said, the theory says there's one agent. So this is a different projection of that one agent, but but. So that's what I mean by a portal is the theory of that, that we will get a theory of, of portals and then we can ask how the psychedelics are acting. Are they actually creating new portals or not? If they're not, we should nevertheless then understand how we could create a new portal, right? Maybe we have to just study what happens when we, make, when we have kids. We know that that technology creates new portals. So we have to reverse engineer that and then say, okay, could we somehow create new portals de novo with that? You know, with, we uh, with something like uh, like a brain computer interfaces, for example. Yeah, so, or maybe just a chemical or something like that. So it's probably more, more complicated than a chemical. That's why I think that the psychedelics, the psychedelics may, because they might be affecting this portal in so, certain ways that it turns it around and opens up. In other words, it may be once we understand what, this thing is a portal, your body is a portal, and understand all of its complexities, maybe we'll realize that that portal can be shifted and, and to different parts of the, the deeper consciousness mm -hmm. and give new windows on it. And so in that way, maybe yes, psychedelics could open up new portals in the sense that they're taking something that's already a complex portal and just tweaking it a bit. Well, but creating is a very powerful difference between morphing. Uh, right, right. <laughs> to intuit the world. Um, it's very, it's practical to think, all right, there's a neural network and what are the different ways, fascinating uh, capabilities can emerge from this neural network. Uh, and I agree, so, it's easier. And so you start to, and then present to yourself the problem of, okay, well, how does consciousness arise? How does intelligence arise? How does, uh, emotion arise? How does memory arise in the, how do we filter within the system all the incoming sensory information? It's, it's like, oh, we're not, we're not 10% done. We're like 0.001% done. Well, it's the, it's the immediate I, feeling. I certainly understand that. My attitude about it is, if you look at the young physicists who are searching for these structures beyond space-time, like Appleton Hayden and so forth, they're having a ball. <laughs> space-time, that's what the old folks did. That's yeah. what that's what our the, the older generation did. We're we're doing something that really is fun and new, and and they're having a blast, and they're finding all all these new structures. So so I I think that we're going to um, whole evolution that whole story where there were no living things, there was just a point. <laughs> And then the explosion, and then just particles at high energy, and then eventually the cooling down and the, the differentiation, and finally matter condenses, and then life, and then consciousness. That whole story has to come out of something that's deeper and without time. And that's what, what we're up to. That's, we, we want to, 
to get that. So the whole story that we've, we've been telling ourselves about the Big Bang and how brains evolved in consciousness will come out of a much deeper theory. And and for yeah, for someone like me, um, it's a lot. I mean, I've, but I want to see them. Uh, kids these days with their non-space time right. assumptions. Uh, it's just interesting looking at the philosophical tradition of the difficult ideas you struggle with. If you look like somebody like uh, Immanuel Kant, what are some interesting agreements and disagreements you have uh, with a guy about the nature of reality? So there's a lot in agreement. Right. So Kant was an idealist, transcendental idealist, and he he basically had the idea that um, we don't see nature as it is. We impose a structure on nature. He, and, and so in some sense, I'm saying something. A lot of different ideas come under idealism and there's a lot of debates and so forth. It it's, tends, tends to be identified with, in many cases, anti-science and anti-realism. And I don't want either connection with my ideas. And so I just called mine conscious realism with an emphasis on realism <laughs> and not, not anti-realism. There's a lot of ingenious arguments in Berkeley. Leibniz, Leibniz in his monadology understood very clearly that the hard problem was not solvable. He, he posed the hard problem and, and basically dismissed it and just said, you can't do this. And so if he came here he and saw where we are, he said, look, guys, I, I told you this three, 300 years ago. And he had his monodology. He was trying to do something like, it's, it's, um, it's different from what I'm doing. What else is there? Evil. Maybe there's the positive aspects of that of meaning, of love. Um, what is the fact that r reality is an illusion? <laughs> Perceived, uh, what, what is the conscious realism when applied to daily life? What kind of impact does it have? A lot. And it's, it's sort of scary. Um, we all know that life is ephemeral. And spiritual traditions have said, wake up to the fact that, you know, anything that you do here is going to disappear. But it's even more ephemeral than perhaps we've thought. I see this bottle because I create it right now. As soon as I look away, that data structure has been garbage collected. That bottle, I have to recreate it every time I look. So I spend all my money and I buy this fancy car. That, that car... I have to keep recreating it every time I look at it. It's that ephemeral. So all the things that we invest ourselves in, we fight over, and we kill each other over, and we have wars over. These are all, it's just like people in a virtual reality simulation, right? And, and there's this, this Porsche, and we all see the Porsche. Well, where, that Porsche exists when I look at it. I turn my headset and I look at it. And... And then if Joe turns his headset in the right way, he, he'll see his Porsche. It's, it's, not, it's not even the same Porsche that I see. He's creating his own Porsche. So these things are exceedingly ephemeral. And, and, and now, uh, just imagine saying that that's my Porsche. Well, you can agree to say that it's your Porsche, but, but really the Porsche only exists as long as you look. So, so this all of a sudden, what the spiritual traditions have been saying for a long, long time, this gets cashed out in, in, in mathematically precise science. It's saying ephemeral, yes, in fact, it, it lasts for a few milliseconds, a few hundred milliseconds while you look at it, and then it's gone. So, so the whole idea, why are we fighting? Why do we hate? It's, we, we fight over possessions. Because we, we think that we're small little objects inside this pre-existing space-time. We assume that, that that mansion and that car exists independent of us and that somehow 
we, these little things, can have our sense of self and importance enhanced by having that special car. That special car. So all of a sudden, when you take this point of view, it, it has all sorts of implications for how we interact with each other, how, how we... Wisdom. They have certain wisdom. They have, I can point to nonsense. I won't go into it, but I can also point to lots of nonsense. So, so the, the, the issue is to then to look for the key, the key insights. And they, I think they have a lot of insights about the, the ephemeral nature of, of objects in space and time and not being attached to them, including our own bodies and reversing that I'm not this little thing, a little consciousness trapped in the body. And the consciousness itself is only a product of the body. So when the body dies, the consciousness disappears. The, it turns completely around. The consciousness is fundamental. The body, my hand exists right now because I'm looking at it. My hand is gone. I have no hand. I have, I have no brain. I have no heart. If you looked, you'll see a heart. Whatever I am is this really complicated thing in consciousness. That's, that's what I am. All the stuff that I thought I was is something that I create on the fly and delete. So this, whole, so this is completely a radical restructuring of how we think about um, possessions, about identity, about survival of death, and, and, and so forth. This is, is completely transformative. But the nice thing is that this whole approach of conscious agents, unlike the spiritual traditions, which have said in some cases, similar things. They've said it imprecisely. This is mathematics. We can actually now begin to state precisely, here's the mathematical model of consciousness, conscious agents. Here's how it maps onto space-time, which I should sketch really briefly. And here's why um, things are ephemeral. And here's why you shouldn't be worried. <laughs> The I and the am and the I am is all kind of emergent through this whole process of evolution and so on. My point of view, I have this conscious agent dynamics. It turns out that the stationary dynamics that I was talking about, the, 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 where the entropy is increasing, all the stationary dynamics are sketched out by permutation matrices. So if you, there's a so-called Birkhoff polytope. All the vertices of this polytope, all the points, are permutation matrices. And all the internal points are Markovian kernels um, that have the uniform measure as a stationary measure. I need to intuit a little better what what the heck you're talking about. But, but so, so basically, there's some complicated thing going on with the network of conscience, conscious agents, and that's mappable to this, that's right. you're saying a two-dimensional matrix that uh, uh, scattering has to do with what? With our, the, the perception, like that's like photon stuff? Or I mean, I don't know if it's useful to sort of uh, dig into detail. I'll, I'll do just the high level thing. I'll yes. Ask. So the, 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 the high level is the long-term behavior of the conscious agent dynamics. So that's the projection of just looking at the long-term behavior I'm hoping will give rise to the amplitudehedron. The amplitudehedron then gives rise to space-time. So then I can just use their link to go all the way from consciousness through its asymptotics to through the amplitudehedron into space-time and get the map all the way into our interface. And that's why you mentioned the permutation matrix because it gives you a nice thing to to try to generate. That's right. It's the connection with the amplitudehedron. The permutation matrices are the core of the amplitudehedron, and it turns out they're the core of the asymptotic description of the conscious agents. So not to sort of bring up the idea of a creator, but I, I like, first of all, I like video games, and you mentioned this kind of simulation idea. First of all, do you think of it as an interesting idea, this thought experiment that we live in a simulation? And in general, do you think we live in a simulation? So the, the Nick Bostrom's idea about the, the simulation is typically 
couched in a physicalist framework. Yes. So there's the bottom level. There's some programmer in a physical space time, and they have a computer that they've programmed real in cleverly where they've created conscious entities. So you have the hard problem of consciousness, right? The standard hard problem. How could a com computer simulation create a consciousness? Which isn't explained by that simulation theory. But then the idea is that the next level, the the entities that are from the that are created in the first level simulation then can write their own simulations and you get this this nesting. So so the idea that um, this is a simulation is fine. But the idea that it starts with a physicalist base, I think, isn't fine. Well, there's the, there's different properties here. The the partial rendering. I mean, to me, that's the interesting idea is not whether the entirety of the universe is simulated, but how efficiently can you um, create interfaces that are convincing to all other entities that can appreciate such interfaces? How little does it take? Because you said like partial rendering or like temporal ephemeral rendering of stuff only render the tree falling in the forest when uh, there's somebody there to see it it's interesting to think how can you do that super efficiently without having to render everything and that to me is one perspective on the simulation just like it is with video games right, right. where a video game doesn't have to render every single thing it's just the thing that the observer is looking at right there is actually that's a <laughs> perception action loop tight and, and it, you have to give them the perceptions that they're expecting if you want them to but if you 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 can lead them along if you give them perceptions that are close to what they're expecting you can then maybe move their reality around a bit yeah it's a tricky engineering problem especially when you're trying to create a product that costs little but that's I, it feels like an engineering problem not a deeply scientific problem um or meaning, obviously, it's a scientific problem, but as a scientific problem, it's not that difficult to trick us uh, descendants of apes. But here's, here's a, a case for just us in our own, if this is a virtual reality that we're experiencing yes. right now. So here's something you can try for yourself. If you just close your eyes and look at your experience in front of you, to be aware of your experience in front of you, what you experience is just like a modeled dark, gray but there's all sort of there's some dynamics to it but it's just dark gray but now i ask you instead of having your attention forward put your atten attention backward what is it like behind you with your eyes closed hmm. and there it's like nothing it's real so what is going on here what what am I experiencing back there? <laughs> right? Well, it's, it's I, I don't know if it's nothing. It's it's like, I guess it's the absence of, it's not even like darkness or something. It's, uh, it, 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 it's not even darkness. It's, it, it's, it, there's no, there's no qualia to yeah. it. And yet there is a sense of being. And that's the interesting thing. Yeah. There's a sense of being back. So I close my eyes. When I put my attention forward, I, just, I have the quality of a gray model thing. But when I put my attention backward, there is no quality at all, but there is a sense of being. Yeah. I, I personally, uh, now you haven't been to that side of the room. I have been to that side of the room. So for me, memories, I start, um, I start uh, playing the engine of memory replay. Which is like I, I take myself back in time and think about that place where I was hanging out in that part. That's what I see when I'm behind. So it's, that's an interesting quirk of hum, humans too. We're able to we're collecting these experiences and we can replay them in interesting ways whenever we feel like it. And it's almost like being. You could do the peekaboo game. You can hide from them and, and appear. And they're fully tricked. And in the same way, we're fully tricked. There's nothing behind us, and we assume there is. And that's really interesting. These theories are pretty heavy. You as a human being, as a mortal human being, how has 
these theories been to you personally? Like, are there good days and bad days when you wake up and look in the mirror and the fact that you can't see anything behind you, <laughs> the fact that it's rendered, like, is there interesting quirks, you know, you know, Nietzsche with his, if you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. Um, how's this theories, these ideas change you as a person? It's been very, very difficult. This stuff is not just abstract theory building because it's it's about us. Sometimes I've realized that there's this big division of me. My my mind is doing all this science and, and coming up with these conclusions, and the rest of me is not integrating. It's just like, I don't believe it. I just don't believe this. I mean, it's, it seems. So as I start to take it seriously, it's get, I, I get scared myself. It's like... <laughs> be possible that we're not seeing the truth it was in 1986 it was from some mathematics we were doing and when that hit me it, it hit me like a ton of bricks i had to sit down it was it it really it was scary it was really a, a shock to the system and then to realize that everything that has been important to me like you know getting a house getting a car, getting a reputation, and so forth. Well, that car is just like the car I see in the virtual reality. It's just there when you perceive it and it's not there. So the whole question of, you know, what am I doing and why? What, what's, what's worthwhile doing in life? Clearly, getting a big house and getting a big car. I mean, we all knew that we were going to die. So we we, all, we we tend not to know that. We tend to hide it, especially when we were young. Before age 30, we don't believe we're going to die. But yeah, we factually maybe know that you you kind of are supposed to, yeah. But but they'll figure something out, and, and yeah. we'll be the generation that is the first one that doesn't have to die. Yeah. We, that, that's the kind of thing. But But when you really face the fact that you're going to die, and then when you when I start to look at it from this point of view, that, well, this thing was an interface... To begin, but intellectually, my my mind, my my emotions, rebel all over the place. It's, it's like I, you know, and so so I have to meditate. I meditate a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what percent of the day would you say you spend as a physicalist, um, sort of living life, pretending your car matters? your reputation matter like uh, like how much uh was that tom Waits song i like my town with a little drop of poison how much poison do you allow yourself to have i think my default mode is physicalist right i think that that's just the default i i when i'm not being conscious yeah consciously attentive then... intellectually consciously attentive because okay. if you're just you're still if you're tasting coffee and not thinking, or, t or drinking, or just taking in the sunset, you're not being intellectual, you're, but you're still experiencing it. Right. So it's when you turn on the, the like the introspective machine, that's when you can start. And, and turn off the thinker. When I actually just start looking without thinking. Huh. So that's, that's when I feel like I, all of a sudden I'm starting to see through. <laughs> sort of like, okay, Part of, part of the addiction to the interface is all the stories I'm telling about it. It's really important for me to get that. Really important to, to yeah. do that. All, so I'm telling all these stories, and it, so I'm all. <laughs> then all of a sudden, um, even my identity, uh, you know, my whole history, my name, my education, and all this stuff, is is almost irrelevant because it's just now here is the present moment and this is this is the reality right now and all of that other stuff is an interface story but this conscious experience right now this is the only this is the only reality as far as i can tell the rest of it's a story and but that is again not my default that is i have to make a really conscious choice to say, okay, 
I know intellectually this is all an interface. I, I'm going to take the headset off and so forth. And, and, and then immediately sink back into the game and just be out there playing the game and, and get lost in it. So I'm always lost in the game unless I literally consciously choose to stop thinking. Isn't it terrifying yeah. to acknowledge that to look beyond the game? Isn't it? Uh, it scares the hell out of me. It, it, it really is scary because I'm so attached. I'm attached to this body. I'm attached I, to the I, interface. Are you ever worried about breaking your brain a bit? Meaning like, it's, uh, I mean, some of these ideas, when you think about reality, even with like Einstein, just realizing, you said interface, just realizing that light, you know, that there's a speed of light and you can't go fast in the speed of light and like what kind of things black holes and can do with light, even that can mess with your head. Yes. But, but that's still space-time. That's a big mess, but it's still just space-time. It's still a, a property of our interface. That's right. But, you, but it's still like even, uh, so, th th you, even Einstein realized that this particular thing, some of the stories we tell ourselves, is constructing interfaces that are o oversimplifying the, the way things work. Um, because the, it's nice. The stories are nice. Stories are nice. This I mean, just like video games. They're nice. Right. And, but Einstein was a realist, right? He was a famous realist in the, in the sense that he, he was very explicit in a 1935 paper with um, Podolsky and Rosen, the, the EPR paper, where he, 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 they said, if without in any way disturbing a system, I can predict with probability one the outcome of a measurement. This is the Lex Free Podcast.